time ago, way back before even I was born, a bunch of mates got together at school and formed a band. That band, Cox Sparrow, has gone on to become probably one of the best known street punk bands. I'm proud to have been part of that band for the past 12, 13 years, and over that time we've collected lots of footage, bits and pieces, odds and sods of tours, gigs, rehearsals, hanging around, that we never really ever thought would honestly see the light of day. But on recording our last gig, Holidays in the Sun 2003, it was decided that we'd release a DVD, and naturally people asked us, do we have any other footage? Well, this is no Hollywood slick production. In true Sparrow style, it's just all our stuff cobbled together for you guys. With us, what you see is what you get. What we could do is film sort of like um, going down the road and speed it up. I'm into a bit of speeded up stuff. And um, we're going to drive faster. <laughs> And we could do like a, why don't we do it on, we've got to have some sort of theme, why don't we do like a, like a Lon red London bus stop top. <laughs> and on our right we have... Uh, our skull and um, when we was here there was uh, those bands wasn't it? Yeah. Those yeah. bands. You were one. I was in one and him, Steve and Mickey were in another band who were crap. <laughs> <laughs> and they wanted some other bit of class obviously, you know, you know, take it forward from there. That's your side. That's my side of the story. Yeah. We rescued him from a terrible band. <laughs> Steve said, oh, the singer's not bad. Let's ask him if he'll join us. And when you went round, didn't you come round to Steve's place? Yeah. I said, let me think about it. <laughs> Give us a break. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I said, let me think about it. I'll come back in a couple of weeks. <laughs> so I went back in a couple of weeks and said, yeah, I'll join. Bruce said, they want you now. Yeah. <laughs> Forget it. I think it was Bruce that first contacted me. Bruce and Burge were recognised to be the best ribbon section at school. And Bruce said, want to come around my house for a bit of a jam? So I turned up, and Bird was already there, and there was another guitarist. And we just spent about three or four hours just covering faces, small faces, stones, numbers. It seemed to go all right, enjoyed it. Nothing much was said. Two days later in the school play round, he came up to me and said, uh, want to join a band? I could ask Colin, who was the singer in the band I was in at the time, to join as well. We reckon you're the best people around. You know, we're the best. Before a little super group. So this is where we went to school, this is where we was educated. Find a seat of learning. As you can see. There were some great teachers. How many years were you here? Twelve, six? Um, eleven to eighteen, I suppose. So, um, Seven years, seven six years. years. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. And we all went here. There was um, Steve, Steve and Mick were in the year above. <laughs> yeah, get <laughs> out. And me and Will were in the uh, year below. And Dale never went to school. Yeah. <laughs>
I went to Watford Grammar School, I'll have you know. Which is where, where I learnt my wheat. Did you have to take an exam to get in? Was it, uh, yeah, it was a 11 plus? 11 plus in those days. So it's for clever kids? <laughs> Did you get like a grant or something? <laughs> I got lucky. Lots of famous people went here. I think you both for it. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Bruce. That's it. No, there are no claims to fame, are there, I don't think. Not really, no. Ronnie Boyce, who scored the winning goal at West Ham in the 1964 Cup final. That's it. Seven O levels here, <laughs> and the two I found were music and German. <laughs> and I've ended up playing so much music in Germany ever since. <laughs> Strangely enough, I very nearly didn't play guitars with Cox Sparrow because I wanted to be a drummer. First band I formed, there were two of us, Dave Hancock and myself, both wanted to be a drummer. So we literally tossed the coin. He won, I lost. He got the drums, I got the guitar. So, and make the best of a bad job. Went out. Listen to every guitarist I could lay my ears on, even stuff I didn't really like. There was always going to be something there I could use, something I could build into my own style. So uh, I had this saying that said, I wouldn't judge a guitarist until I walked a mile with his guitar. That way, if I judged him and I found I didn't like him, at least I was a mile away and I had his guitar. Gigs in those days were uh, church halls, Trinities, that was a youth club. There was about 300 people there, same nights. That's sick, Mr. Little, little bit of a fiver. No such thing as a bad gig, all building experience, all building a reputation. We started getting some other stuff, invites to come and support secondary bands at uh, places like the Bridge House. Again, never turned them down, hardly any, ever had any money in it, enough money to get the petrol there and back. It was all fun. This is, um, this is Trinity's, which was where we used to play when we were still at school. We used to rehearse down here. Um, we have really done our first ever gigs down here on a Friday night, didn't we? Yeah, we used to play every other Friday. And then the other Fridays, Will, our road manager, used to do a disco. <laughs> a disco. <laughs> and he would tell the story that he actually got paid more than we did, which is probably true. Yeah. But we used to play in here, come out of here, Going to Burnell Arms, which is a pub just over there on the corner, uh, and spend it all. And it was the Burnell Arms that had the famous geezer with the uh, painted tie. Remember? That's right, yeah. The little old boy used to go in there, used to paint his tie. Every night he'd come with a different colour tie on. And by the end of about six months, about that thick. Tie tie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not bad. Not bad. What kind of public was there? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, where we went to it was an all boys school. And just over the road there, was an old girls school. So we used to have uh, a lot of girls, didn't we? Yeah. What sort of era are you talking about? What year were you at? We were probably about 1973, I would have thought. I was one. Yeah, 73. Shut up! <laughs> 73, 74. But we played here for, oh, I don't know, six months a year, wasn't it? Going about a year, oh, I think, yeah. yeah. And these were this is really our first, our first quite popular. I mean, there was a lot of people going there. That's Boxborough. That's Boxborough. In fact, it was at this place here, that we found earlier, that um, I actually met Gary Lambert for the first time. We were rehearsing here. Um, we needed another guitarist. Um, Steve brought Gary along, because Gary was Steve's coach. And uh, he had a guitar, he had an amp, so he could join straight away. That was the only, uh, that was the only criteria. And, um, yeah, he came down, we met him here, and uh, he joined the band after one rehearsal, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What's your memories? I think we were pretty good in those days, weren't we? I was. <laughs> <laughs> you were still early. You hadn't perfected the one no face yet. No. Are you still using the same uh, lead strings. set of strings? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I get the rust off from there. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was... Uh, we did a lot of covers and Mickey's good at, he's a really good guitarist and he's good at getting um, the sounds that are on the records, you know, so we used to sound quite like, like the records, didn't we? Yeah. Uh, I think the music we were playing at the time, mostly covers, um, anything, pop, rock, um, stuff out the charts, 
as I say, build a repertoire, but nothing really much of our own. Started building in one or two songs, seeing how they went down, seeing the reaction of the audience. Um, and I think when we had about half covers and half of our own songs, we started getting some more interest from, uh, well, I think it was Berger, went around all the clubs, just chatting us around. We ended up getting gigs at the Roundhouse at Dagnum, um, some of the secondary, well, bit, maybe better than secondary, but some of the sort of, in our, in our environment, the premier, I guess, um, rock venues that are around. And we were supporting bands like Stray, I think it was, Thin Lizzy, Motorhead. Um, always building a reputation. Some of these bands sort of uh, like the stuff we were doing. Nothing too rebellious, you know. Our own brand of sort of slightly heavy pop. Um, and I think it was about that time that Decker came along and, uh, and saw us. And I suppose the rest after that is history. We were just learning how, you know, learning, uh, learning how to do it, really, in those days, weren't we? I mean, you know, Nick used to learn all the songs. Um, Bruce used to sit at the back looking pretty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. <laughs> oh, humble Pie, that was another... Yeah, yeah, still, yeah. He's, he's he's done some Humble Pie songs. That was Steve Marriott. I think that was Steve, our Steve's favourite drummer, actually. Jerry Sheldon, wasn't it? Yeah. Big influence on him. So that was all pre-punk. Burgess Road! Yeah. <laughs> Spelt wrong. That's what? That one. Oh yeah. <laughs> How many times? How many times? <laughs> I can't do the turn in the I guess I was moving the body. Yeah. I was 14. <laughs> Someone said, come see this band Black Sabbath at Romford. I went down there and I couldn't believe how loud it was. <laughs> I couldn't hear for about three days afterwards. Tell us about the Dagnum Roundhouse. Uh, played there loads of times, can't remember who we supported. Um, loads of people. Was it Motorhead? Those of people. We used to get down there early, didn't we, as the band was setting up and helping carry the gear in and things like that and getting for nothing. Yeah. And, uh, We're all still at school then. Yeah. And we just got loads of support slots. I remember having, Supporting everybody. I remember getting a brand new motorbike at the showroom that morning. And I think we were due to play there that night, so drove to it on the motorbike. And Burge says, let's have a go. So, in a complete mug, I said, yeah, all right. Drove off in the distance. Didn't appear for about an hour later pushing it. it come off, it totaled the thing. <laughs> I still owe you for that. You still owe me for that, yeah. So I'll pay for that number. <laughs> How'd you come off? I can't ride a motor. Bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you let me do it. <laughs> you do still owe me for that. But in those days, all the bands that only play 40,000 seater shows now, they used to come down there and play to like a thousand people. Yeah, it was great. And we supported nearly all of them. There's, um, there's a story that, that we tell about um, when we was rehearsing sort of you know, pre-punk I think and uh, Malcolm Cohen came to uh, came to one of the rehearsals I guess he was looking for a band at the time to do something with and as we all know the story that turned out to be uh, Sex Pistols and such but he came to see us here uh, which is a long way long way from the King's Road yeah, he came all the way from Chelsea <laughs> God bless him this is, this is the roading club in, in Manor Park and uh, I don't know like, how we ended up rehearsing here but Mickey's mum and dad used to live just around the corner up there so they may have had something to do a bit I don't know but this is the famous road, and as I say, this is where um, uh, McLaren didn't take up his option on Cox Barry. That's right, yeah. When he turned up, we couldn't believe it. He turned up with another guy, and it was before punk, and we couldn't believe how they were dressed. They were incredible. We were just there in jeans or something, and he turned up with all this gear, and it looked absolutely brilliant. What on earth is going on here? <laughs> is that what we thought? <laughs> And uh, we played a load of terrible songs to him, but he still uh, he still suggested that we supported his new band, didn't he? He said, "I've got a new band. You can support me in Soho or something." And obviously that turned out to be the Sex Pistols. 
And we didn't. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we said we ain't supporting no one. That was the end of that. Uh, one of our better decisions. Yeah. <laughs> so it would have been the come anyway. Yeah. <laughs> haven't got drowning. Right. Done. Yeah. No, I just realized you didn't like pants in that space. No. Yeah, I think the thing about uh, when we joined Decca was it really opened our eyes. I mean, this was what we thought the music business was all, all about. You know, proper studios. All our samplers up till then have been just little immediate takes, two track, four track. Just real, real difficult venues, always, always smelling of damp, hardly any equipment. But uh, Decca, there, there were mentions, there were enormous recording studios. I think I went into a recording studio one day where the Moody Blues had been recording the week before. It was the size of what well, looked to me like the Festival Hall, just for one band. It showed you what music business could be like. And they started sort of giving us an idea that uh, we might be able to make it. And, and we got access to some good uh, production people. Nick Torr, I remember, being absolutely excellent. Made a great guitar sound, made a great drum sound. And we started sort of writing some pretty good stuff in. I think over the time it went a bit sour. We started realising that uh, certainly in any of all these recording costs were going against accounts and we were with this being in debt to them for years and it didn't take a genius to realise that uh, our royalties that was, would have to be phenomenal to, just to break even. So uh, we started getting a bit more aggressive with them. But uh, there was some good stuff. I mean, we, they got us the small faces to it. I think they paid two and a half grand to get us on the tour. That was a sort of arrangement, again, against future royalties. But we had a good time. We were going around, I think, at the Albany at Birmingham. What a magnificent hotel. We always remember that. Swimming pools. It wasn't movie stars, but it was getting close. It felt good. Yes, in those days, didn't we? I suppose after Decca, I mean, we were really into the Shock Troops era. And I, I think there are some great songs on that album. I always regretted a little bit that. That was done so quickly. I mean, we did have the best sound we ever had um, for some of those sessions we had with Nick Talbot. Um, I used to do all the Thin Lizzy stuff. He's really spot on in production. Really enjoyed the, the, the time in, in Chelsea with, with, you know, where, where we actually did the recording. But I think it was all over in about a week, ten days. It was about three days recording them, um, three days production, a couple of days sort of um, doing the final pare down. Uh, and then it was all over. And, and there was no chance to go back and say, I think I could have done that better. It's, it's all history. It's, it's, it's not a real problem because the, you know, the album's been well received and critical acclaim. But I think we could have done it better. I think Sparrow overall has probably been more of a live band, a recording band. All the recordings we've done since that kind of been two, three days here. Not long experiences. No chance to, to sort of work the song. Um, I think in the early days, things like Rain work. That, that got gigged. Um, started off with a certain sound and got better and better and better. So we went and did with Decca, we, we were really cooking. Um, we could have done some other stuff, but I think some of the stuff off of Shock Troops that we do live now is better than Shock Troops. Uh, famous bridge house, home of the many foreskins, gigs, cockney rejects, Bushel's birthday party, blah de blah de blah. Not here anymore. And then, yeah, that says it all a bit, I think. Memories for us, run by a brilliant, a brilliant bloke called Terry Murphy, who gave us our first gigs down here. Uh, that's when we started really sort of becoming a punk band and uh, writing our own songs. We put, so, we put bands on every every night of the week down here and um, went out of gap. We used to tell used to give it to us. We used to come down to play on a Wednesday night or a Tuesday night to like two people. And um, it's like a rehearsal for us, but you know, we, we learned a lot from it. And they used to pay us five pounds for doing it. Which used to give us straight back to him and say, there you go, sit there behind a bar. Yeah, but we would have that afterwards. Yeah. But uh, it's quite famous, the, the Bridge House in Canning Town, for, num for a number of reasons, really. I mean, you know, loads, loads of 
good bands that, that, that we like, you know, sort of play there, I mean, the Four Skins, um, a couple of rejects, of the resident house band for a while down here. Um, you know, Bushel's birthday bash, it was a hell down here, it was a good play that. Um, but yeah, a lot of memories, a lot of memories of this place, and uh, it's a shame that it ain't here that much. Steve Marriott played it, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. And Steve Marriott played it after uh, school practice. Got back together again, and off we died. I think the last gig of that sort of period I remember was uh, Gary Bush's birthday bash at the Bridge House. I think we had about 700 skinheads in there, all the pool tables were crowded, people up on the, on the window ledges. It was the first time my wife saw it, she was absolutely amazed. You know, I told her we used to have a, a good folly, but uh, to see it in action was quite something. Yeah, that's Yeah, that's it. That's where it was. Down at the Black Boy, they were there in force. Give them a minute. Where are we now, Cole? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is uh, this is uh, on the Marlin Road. That's the uh, the old Black Boy pub. Uh, made famous in uh, the song Argy Bargy, where he says. Uh, down at the Black Bull they were there in force, and he was right, of course. Right, who was there for a start? <laughs> the Black Bull ain't there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> every, every place we've been to is now gone. So we've been down. burnt, shut down, or yeah. raised to the ground. Absolutely. That's it, made famous. Makes the perfect fried chicken plate. <laughs> <laughs> another place suffers asparagus. <laughs> Turned up, shut down. <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that shut down. <laughs> I really did. I thought that was too open. See, a lot of thought went into planning all these uh, locations for you. This is called We're Coming Back. You were born in that road. Born in that road, that road. Moments like that, lost. Oh, yeah, no, right. nah, 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 nah. We should go see bands here as well, didn't we? Yeah. Train yeah. What have you seen here? Egg the Broken Band. <laughs> yeah. I can say. Feeling all decent? No. Yeah. 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 I'm walking. Here we are at Upton Park. <laughs> All the ones. <laughs> All the ones. <laughs> 20 <laughs> Mind me, yeah? Change here for That's not a bad sight, is it? On Vicarage Road, Watford. <laughs> First time you've seen it, Darrell? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've tried not to uh, ever come here before. Obviously, uh, we got Elton John at Watford, so why would you ever need to go to uh, yeah. East London? Yeah, this is the uh, home, of the, home of the gods. No, last time I was here, it didn't look anything like that. Were you drinking in those days, Darrell? <laughs> 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 Were you going for a sober period in your life? That's a look. It's all new. Well, two years, two, three years. Oh, there you go. And they're playing Wigan tomorrow, so... Last day of the season. Isn't Last it? match of the season. Yeah. Got to win. Got to win. 
I remember, I think, I think that's where uh, Watford John run the RCF round about there. <laughs> <laughs> That's, his the, own. that's the funniest thing you've seen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We used to come down here on a Saturday and um, we used to know a bloke who worked on the gate on the turnstile. And we used to bung him uh, 10 bob, 50 p in, uh, in those days. <laughs> bob. <laughs> 10 bob. He's let us in. And we've done it for a couple of seasons. Saved ourselves a fortune. Absolutely a fortune. There's an armor going around the south bank of the old western coast as it was. And we just turned up one day and we said, uh, Here's see John. <laughs> so, mate, you know, John don't work here anymore. John had been nabbed. So, I got to pay uh, full price like everyone else did. And you guys, eh? And the punchline. <laughs> <is. laughs> There's no punchline. I'm what are you going to say, and, uh, and you know who that was? <laughs> <laughs> it's Jimmy Hill. No, there was no punchline. Kevin Keegan. I think after that we um, we gave it a rest for a few years. And uh, really, Bruce had kept it going. I mean, he, he, as you probably know, he bought a pub and stick a rock in, in Bethnal Green. Um, and he had a band, he called it the management, basically, him and, and uh, some musicians, some singers that were doing well on the circuit. Um, plus Burge, quite often, and myself on lead guitar. And we just did covers. Uh, well, we'd have theme nights, 70 nights, 70s nights, 80s nights, punk nights, heavy rock nights. Kept our handy, kept us developing, kept us in touch. Yeah, back in the 90s, I had a band, The Elite, and we were doing the usual gigs on the circuit, one of which was a Sticker Rock, a pub in Bethnal Green in East London, which it turns out was owned by Steve Bruce, the Cox Barrow drummer. We did quite a few gigs down there. We played with the Addicts, Blitz, Chelsea, and we headlined a few times on, on our own. Once word went out that it was owned by the Cox Barrow drummer, naturally, Everyone on the scene started badgering him. When are you going to reform the band? The music wasn't the only reason we kept in touch. We used to have parties all the time, but uh, it was nice to still be playing together. And when the opportunity came along, it was in 92, and uh, we got the invitation to play the Astoria. It was really down to Bruce, because it was somebody who came into his pub and said, we don't know how big you are, there's, there's, there's following out there, really want to see you. We didn't believe it, had a good laugh and a drink with him. But he came up with a, with a real offer, he went and did it, and uh, haven't looked back since then. It was Steve's mate and uh, guy who actually worked at the pub, Perry, that convinced him in the end it's something that, that pretty much should be done. And when a firm offer came through for a gig at the Astoria in London, which was the 4th of October 1992, if my memory serves me right, um, Steve put it to the band and uh, they said yes. Yeah, the day itself was a good day. I remember we all met up early in the morning and uh, made our way down to the Sticker Rock where we had a last minute rehearsal just to run through a few of the songs, uh, getting the spirit of things and it turned into a mini gig really, word got around, people came down, the doors were open and uh, yeah, it was, it was good.
absolutely fantastic, packed, people singing word for word and uh, something I've, I've never experienced before really.
funny how I ended up in the band. Steve came up to me and uh, said, do you want to play with Cox Sparrow? And I said, yeah, all right. As I walked off, Mark Hannon, drummer of the Elite, said to me, are you mad? You've just been asked to play for Cox Sparrow. And you go, yeah, all right. And I didn't actually realise, I thought he meant, do you want the Elite to support Cox Sparrow? Do you want to play with us? I didn't actually realise I'd been asked to join the band. So there's me all calm and collected, yeah, all right. And I've just been asked to play for, you know, a band that I'd looked up to since I was a kid, and uh, every band I've ever been in has done their covers. Um, turned up to the first rehearsal, and it was like an extended family. Lots of laughter, lots of banter, good fun to be around, good people. And uh, after I showed them how to play their songs, we rehearsed it up and we were ready for the London gig. Yeah, the first tour, 1994. Um, really, really good. I'd never done anything like that before, and I'm sure the guys hadn't done anything like that for a long, long time. 14 dates in 17 days, stuck in the back of a smelly transit van, and all around Europe, Germany, Austria, Italy, France, Belgium. Went through Switzerland, up the Alps, round the Alps, through the Alps, never actually did a gig there. Um, but it's it was good, it's something we haven't done since. The uh, gigs since have been uh, totally different. Back then there were a lot of punk squats, uh, smaller um, clubs, smaller audiences, but uh, there was something really special about that tour. Uh, something I'm really pleased that, that I've done to be honest with you.
lucky with our support bands. When you're stuck on the road for a couple of weeks with people, um, having a good support band can make all the difference. And, and we've been quite lucky that the people we've had around us have, have always been, been really good. And the first tour, perhaps the most important one, when you're on the road for, say, for two weeks. Um, Vulture Culture, fantastic band, great people, and they remain good friends to, to this day. So, yeah, we've always been quite lucky with uh, who we've been on tour with. This is called Secret Army. <laughs> Collecting funds for the holy fight Like the God of all sounds within the dead of night Russian guns help him on his way Fork with money from the USA The ordinary people say What's it for? The ordinary people say We want no more But the man on the top knows where to do the most harm Is in the secret army Every yeah, man with a gun says not a sound On this aeroplane turned around Spend his life learning how to fill a man with lead Probably spend the rest of his day But the ordinary people say What's it for? The ordinary people say We want no the man at the top knows where to do the most harms in the secret army. When a bomb goes off in the city street, man gets killed for his belief. Mother cries for the son she had That's when the world's gone mad The ordinary people say The ordinary people say None of the top knows where to do the most harm Is in the secret army And the ordinary people say The ordinary people say The man of the top knows where to do the most harm Is in the secret army Is in the secret army Is in the secret Grazie.
second tour in 95 was a lot different. Uh, although Ollie did us proud, the guy who organised the first tour, uh, I mean he really had an uphill struggle because um, it was the first time we'd been out there, no one knew what to expect, how we would go down, who would turn up. We almost needed to, to do that tour to, to test the water and let everyone know that it's not a rumour, yes the band are back and we are touring. When we went back out the following year, obviously word had got around and it was, it was a lot bigger. Ralph Fracco, who, who booked the tour, really did us proud and we had good accommodation. Good travel arrangements, fantastic security, uh, who've become personal friends, and uh, good venues, and large crowds, and uh, yeah, that, that was the first time we really realised sort of uh, how popular the band is. And uh, Germany almost felt like like home at that point. Um, we, we went down really well out there, and uh, it was the right amount of dates as well. Four dates: Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday means you're not doing a, a gig on a Tuesday night in the back of nowhere having already done six gigs and the throat's going and you're tired and you've had no sleep so um, we sort of found out found our formula really and um, yeah it was good here's a song and you've got to sing it this is called Take um, oh. <laughs>
first two tours there wasn't really any plans to, to do any more really. Um, to be honest with you it's a lot of hassle putting tours together and, and no one was really up for doing it. So I said to the guys well if I can get something together would you be interested and they said yeah crack on go for it. Uh, so I got together with Fracco and we put together a, a one day uh, show in uh, Munich at the old airport which was a really bizarre venue because it was actually the old airport in Munich and it was still standing and everything was there as per an airport um, but they'd stuck a stage in the middle of it and turned it into a music venue. Um, it's a good gig, biggest one we've done so far, about two and a half thousand people. Uh, we had major accident and the crack supporting and uh, um, the venue was, was cool. Oasis were playing there four days uh, later so shows you the sort of caliber of gig it was um, and it was nice as well because they were they were pulling the venue down not long after in fact most places Cox Sparrow play funnily enough either end up getting burnt down pulled down closed down shut down or they run down um, so it was nice to do that that gig before they uh, got rid of it I was obviously a fan of the band long before I was in them, um, but uh, it made me realise that someone somewhere uh, is making a lot of money off the back of Cox Sparrow, uh, and probably always uh, has really. So it made me a little bit more confident with all the gigs I've booked since to uh, ask for what I think we're worth. Uh, at the end of the day this band puts bums on seats and uh, you could take a lot of other bands off of bills and it wouldn't make a lot of difference but um, without being big headed you sort of like know that you've got Cox Barrow playing and you're guaranteed to have a good turnout. Um, I think you've really got two choices, you either cut the ticket price so the kids get in cheaper or if that's what promoters are, are going to charge then you, you, you think well what are we worth and you ask for what, what you're worth and, um, and I did and uh, no one batted an eyelid and, and we started getting it.
money went up, the gigs went up, and uh, um, along with that, people start saying things like, oh, you're only in it for the money, um, which is absolute nonsense. Uh, Cox Barrow have been offered a lot of money to do stuff in the past, and, and you know, we haven't done it. It's got to feel right, we've got to want to do it, um, everyone's got to want to do it. Um, it's not about the money, obviously the money uh, needs to be there, it needs to be a half decent deal, but um, we've been offered a lot of money before and not done things, so that, that's not our primary concern, but we do know what we're worth and we're not frightened to ask for it. Um, Cox Barrow isn't a band that needs to go out for uh, um, a couple hundred quid in a packet of fags anymore. So 1997, uh, our third tour really, and concentrated on, on, on Germany. It was billed as for the very last time in Germany, which we've taken a bit of stick for since, because uh, we have been back uh, since, but uh, through no fault of our own. Um, we've got nothing against Germany, in fact, personally speaking, it's my favourite country to play, um, but we'd sort of like done it to death really, we didn't want to keep going back and uh, we're not a cabaret band, um, we're not going to keep doing it, so each time we go back, the audience are getting smaller and smaller. We've, we've pretty much done the whole of Germany and had a really good time there. We went back at the end of uh, 97, October the 2nd to the 5th, um, and we did uh, um, Hamburg and um, Leipzig, Speyer and, and Krefeld, four dates in Germany, and they, they were great, really good. We had Mad Sin and Oxymoron supporting. Um, uh, the gigs were good, I got some good footage uh, from them, um, but we pretty much thought that, you know, we, we've done it now and there's uh, other places that were coming through saying, you know, why don't you play here, why are you always going back to Germany and um, we thought that would be the, uh, the last one. We hadn't said we were splitting up, it wasn't our last tour ever, uh, but uh, it was the last, last time we were, were going to play Germany. As it happens, um, we played there one more time in Berlin, Holidays in the Sun, but uh, that's not because it was booked in Berlin. It was originally supposed to be in Belgium, but uh, due to venue problems it got moved to Berlin at the last minute, so uh, it's a little bit out of our control. That said, personally I'll go back to, uh, to Germany, uh, Germany every day of the week. I think it's a fantastic country, great people, you always get really well looked after, good shows and uh, you know, not, none of us have got a problem with it. It's just that we felt that we um, we'd done a lot of gigs. I mean, it was our third tour, and uh, again, concentrating only on Germany. And uh, um, you know, it was time, time to move elsewhere. Really, in our heart of hearts, England was the place that we we, we really wanted to play. Um, but at this stage, we still couldn't ever see that actually becoming a reality. Um, so it was uh, um, America next, really, for us. It was on the cards. We didn't really do anything until 2000 when we went to the States. Uh, that took a long time to sort that out and get that together, uh, getting all the work permits and visas. In fact, it's the only reason we did the live album when we were out there, purely and simply as, as an aid to, to help us get into the country. We thought that if an American company was making an album and would benefit by us being there, then uh, that would help, and evidently uh, it did. Hindsight, it was probably a bit mad doing four dates in four days on both coasts, but um, because of time and work commitments, we only had that amount of time available to us, and we didn't want to do one coast to the exclusion of, of the other. We wanted to try and get to see as many people as, as possible. Uh, so February the 10th, we started off at CBGB's in New York, uh, 
legendary venue, somewhere we'd all always wanted to, to, to play, and uh, that was a good gig. Next day, up to the Karma Club in Boston, where we went up with the Dropkick Murphys, and Colin went off and did some moonlighting in the, in the studio with them. flew from Boston to New York and then New York to San Francisco and when we arrived in San Francisco we were all fucked, perfectly honest with you. Um, but it was the, the adrenaline we got from the crowd, it was a fantastic audience, great venue, really good atmosphere that, that got us through that gig and it was probably playing and, and gig wise the, the best gig out of the four dates. Um, and it was off to LA for the next day before we then uh, came back home again. Again, we were lucky, the people we were working with were, were great, CKO Records and, and all the, the guys that were, were with them with the promotion company were, were fantastic, uh, looked after us really well, good people. Uh, we played with the Reducers, SF, great band. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it really helps when you've got good people around you, when, when you're you know, far away from home and you really don't know what on earth to expect. Um, well organised and uh, you yeah, know to get back there soon one day and watch this space. Darren Russell called me uh, before the first ever Holidays in the Sun and off offered the gig to Cox Barrow to be the headlining act and I had to tell him that we had no plans on playing England at that stage, but you know, if things would ever change, he'd be the first to know, and I'd give him first refusal. But you've got to realise that the band had played England in 1983, and there'd been trouble. Uh, the gig we did in '92 at the Astoria was fine when we were on stage, but after we finished, there was trouble. And we're all that little bit older, and to be honest with you, it doesn't doesn't feel good when you know that you're there providing the the entertainment for for your punters and uh, someone could go home uh, getting hurt that's not why we do it so we sort of avoided playing England purely and simply because you know we don't want anyone to be hurt at a Cox Sparrow gig and we could go abroad and everything was absolutely fine no trouble got really well treated and uh, uh, you know you're going to go to where you're appreciated and you haven't got some idiot having, uh, wanting to have a row um, but in our heart of hearts we we want to play England, it's, it's our home country, it's, it's where we're from, so um, we sort of always held out hope that things might change, but never really thought that, that it would. I've been going to all the holidays in the Sun festivals and, and saw a real change in, in atmosphere of gigs. 
people use it as a social, it's, it's a social event, bands and punters alike, it's uh, something that we, we all have in our calendars and, and look forward to each year. So I was sort of monitoring it and letting the guys know that I thought it would be okay. Um, they decided to test the water with, uh, with the arrangements and the promotion side by, by using the promoters. Um, and the first gig we did for them was Holidays in the Sun Berlin, which was the 6th of May 2000. Venue was huge, really, really good. Uh, good strong lineup. And, uh, you know, it was, it was good for our first uh, holidays uh, in, in the sun.
Just in case no one makes it home. <laughs> no amount of interviews or, or footage is ever going to capture what it's like to be on tour. It's something that uh, you really do have to be there. And the thing with us is there's always a lot of laughter and a lot of banter that uh, goes on and the cameras are never around to, to film it. So you're not going to quite get the feeling what, uh, watching this, but, but trust me, there's a, uh, a lot of laughs on tour. and. Um, the only thing to remember is uh, never play cards with Will Murray. What's going on here? Oh, then, Will. Anyone want to share the room? How much is that, miss? Anything else? Yeah, please, yeah. Could I have a half of a um, very cheap beer? What's <laughs> that? <laughs> Later on in the year, uh, October the 26th, we went to the Basque region where we did uh, a genuine holidays in the sun, actually in the sun, and uh, again this was a really good show and it sort of cemented the relationship really between us and, uh, and Darren and Jenny um, and it became a lot easier then to put a proposal together which uh, Darren and I did to put to the band for uh, getting us back to where we belonged and uh, that, that was playing in the game. since 94 um, all I can say is it's been getting better and better and increasing incredulity every concert we've done those 14 concerts we did in 70 nights in seven countries across Europe absolutely amazing back like the old days we were in the back of the van all crushed up didn't have as much gear in there with us but uh, enough lots of miles lots of discomfort but it's all worth it every gig since then has been top class professional I mean, fans have been fantastic Every time we, we go somewhere, there's somebody's driven miles or travelled for days. I think there was a guy from Poland when we played Berlin or Leipzig or something. It was absolutely amazing that weekend. I think there were about 20 of them actually. I suppose the, the icing of the cherry on the cake for me is, is back playing in England again. I mean, Morecambe is. Uh, I love America and I love Europe. I love all the concerts we've played, but, but playing at Morgan really was uh, taking my breath away. I've wanted to do that for so long. Really re resented not being able to play in England, my own country, not getting the opportunity to do it, not to get a chance to do it properly. And uh, all I can say is the re reaction of the fans that have been there just blown me away. People coming from Australia, from Canada, West, West Virginia, Brazil. Brilliant. People with tattoos of sparrow on their arm. Goodness me, where does that come from? 7th of July 2001, back in England, first time for Holidays in the Sun UK, and uh, what a gig! Really good, absolutely packed. 
nice to hear the English singing in England belongs to me for a change. This time, this time, this time by French, by Germans, by the Austrians, by the Spanish, by the Americans, all the rest of them. too good, it's almost like the perfect gig, it would have been a good one to go out on, a good, a good one to end on. Uh, the guys had their kids there, we all had family around, uh, fantastic atmosphere, really really good gig, it was the 25th anniversary of Punk so there was, there was a lot of coverage, good exposure and it would have been a, a nice one to end on. If we're being honest, one day is going to have to be the last gig, it's not going to go on forever and we're probably nearer the end than, than we are at the beginning if we're being realistic. And you want your last gig to be a, a, a right blinder, one that you're, you're proud of and uh, is, is going to stay with you forever. And it, it would have been an ideal one, but we hadn't said it was our last gig. So we agreed to do 2003 pretty much with it in the back of our minds that we probably aren't going to do a lot more. And it'd be nice to film it and record it. So we've, we, we've got something, uh, you know, for, for the future to, to look back on, really. Um, that said, we will we'll never split up. Cox Barrow isn't a band that can ever split up. We're still all together, whether we're doing shows or not. You know, we, we all sort of hang out and uh, go out for meals and meet up and whatever. So it's it's not really a case of splitting up. It's just that there's probably not a lot of plans to do a lot more. Um, might be a couple more in the pipeline. You never know. So uh, yeah, you have to wait and see. No, I don't want to stay there. A lot of people ask me, what's it like to be in Coxbower? And I tell them, well, you know, it's like hanging around with any group of elderly people. They're forgetful and, you know, you have to help them cross the road and they dribble a lot and stuff. But uh, really, it's just like being in a, in a big family. A lot of bands sing about unity and, and preach togetherness and, and talk about the scene and, and whatever, but really they can't stand the sight of each other. And some bands throughout history, a lot of famous bands have sort of fed off that tension and used it as a creative process, but it's all bollocks really, isn't it? At the end of the day, if you're going to make music with people and you hang around with people, you want to hang around with your friends and hang out with people you respect and you like. Uh, and that's, that's what it's like with Cox Sparrow. And well, I've been in the band for 12, 13 years and I've been sort of running the, the gigs and booking everything for the past eight years. I was a fan of the band long before I was in it and I'll always consider Cox Barra to be uh, the guys plus Will, the, the road manager. And, um, you know, I can look on it from, from an outsider's point of view while still having the privilege of being in the band and uh, look at it from both both perspectives and say that uh, it's... it's it's been a good band to be in and uh, I can see why they mean so much to people. Um, at the end of the day, there's not a lot of bands on the scene that reduce grown men, right big lumps, skinhead hooligan lumps, to tears. And we've come off stage and, and seen, you know, proper geezers with lumps in their throats and tears in their eyes that uh, have been really touched and the Cox Barrow means something to them. And no other band touches people like that and you've got, you've got to ask yourself why. Um, I think 
coming out of the punk thing, you had a lot of the sort of trendy middle class art school punks and uh, Cox Barra gave a, a real alternative, you know, something that real people could relate to. Um, you had other bands like Sham and, and the Rejects that were, that were similar and uh, were very anthemic and, and, and from the terraces. Um, I think with Cox Barra, you, with that you got um, you know, good lyrics and, and, and good melodies, stuff that you could sort of sing and kicks around in your head and, and, and they're well written songs and you know, Steve Burgess should be up there with, with ABBA and uh, all the other great songwriters um, throughout history to be honest with you. With all the shit that goes around being in the band, all the hanging around, all the sound checks, all the crap you get, the, the interviews with the same questions over and over and people having a pop and having a dig and always wanting to, uh, to have a knock and, and whatever, it's all pretty much irrelevant for like the hour and a half we're on stage because everyone else just disappears and it's just us and, and, and the crowd and um, that's, that's, that's why we do it, that's, that's, what, that's what we do it for. Stage. I mean, you have that passion and drive yeah, Yeah.